I wonder if we can get seated and get going. We have a long program, and we don't want to hold people here all afternoon, although it may be fun. Thank you all for coming. As you all know, during the last, um, during all of this month, the MLLC is putting on a program uh, organized uh, very well by Bruce Pappas and Dane Kelly and other members of his community on the issue of uh, mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, we started out uh, two weeks ago with a discussion of Michelle Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow, and uh, a week ago Saturday we had uh, uh, Matthew's uh, movie, uh, Broken on All Sides, uh, and today we're very fortunate to have Matthew, who was the director of that movie, uh, here to uh, talk about it. Well, um, Keystone, uh, our key speaker today is uh, Matt Pilcher, who graduated in uh, 2000 from Bennington College with a degree in filmmaking. In 2010, he graduated from Temple University's Beasley School of Law and is now a licensed attorney in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Matt worked as a staff attorney at the Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, helping people with problems due to their criminal records. Matt is the director of the movie, Broken on All Sides, Race, Mass Incarceration, and New Visions for Criminal Justice in the United States. He's been touring the movies and speaking at libraries, universities, and churches, community centers across the country as part of a national a public education and organizing campaign to raise consciousness around these issues and to connect groups in different localities working on different aspects of criminal justice reform. I went on his website, which is www.brokenonallsides.com, which any, if anyone is interested in the film can go on, and he is indeed giving uh, uh, talks in uh, all around the country. I, I saw in Eugene, uh, Washington, to Maine, to Massachusetts, Texas. So it's our pleasure to have Matt Pilcher. Thank you. I'm just going to set my timer so I don't go over. Uh... So let me say, first of all, thank you very much for having us. I think um, it's great to see what your congregation has done this month, um, a lot of impressive events. And I'm honored to have my movie shown and to be here to talk with you a little bit about these issues. Uh, and I'm also sorry I wasn't able to make it um, for the sermon this morning. I would have loved to have heard that. And, um, you know, I do like, uh, I go to the Unitarian Church in Center City occasionally, and I have uh, an affinity for the Unitarians, so I'm glad to, to be here. Um, I, I wasn't able to come because I flew in from Detroit this morning on one of these uh, tours that I've been doing. So I was in Ann Arbor for a screening on Thursday and then uh, Detroit for, for a screening. Um, so, you know, I congratulate you on the first step of doing the, uh, the, the study group around the new Jim Crow, the events you're holding now, and um, I just want to encourage you to follow through um, by walking the walk, and I know that's not always easy to figure out how to do that, um, how to get involved, so I'm happy that this panel is here um, to talk a little bit about that, and there's several groups represented um, that, you know, you have the possibility to get involved with in the area. For me, though, I'm really going to focus on uh, my time on the history of mass incarceration and systemic racism and sort of how we got to this point. A uh, little more about me. I became an activist about 10 years ago, and um, I'm a member of the National Lawyers Guild, the International Socialist Organization, and Decarcerate PA. Um, that's represented a lot of people go to decarcerate here. <laughs> Um, and those are all great groups that I think are attacking this issue in different ways. Um, I became involved with these issues, I guess, first when I was living in Cincinnati and I did a lot of organizing around uh, police brutality that was going on. This is 10 years, 8 to 10 years ago. Um, Anti-racist organizing um, and, and my activism, I came back, moved here, back to Philly where I grew up, and my activism led me to law school to try and figure out how to understand the legal system, you know, knowing that that is a part of the status quo, often 
times a lot of the problem in, in, in oppression in society. Um, and I worked for a bit as a lawyer, and now I'm doing um, this full time. And I, I worked for several nonprofits and um, law firms that did prisoners' rights that were suing the city and the jail system for overcrowding. And my movie, Broken on All Sides, sort of started as a short piece to accompany the lawsuit that was going on and try and let the public know what was going on, what did it look like inside our jails, because you know it is literally walled off to keep the prisoners in and to keep everyone else out. And that's a big part of the problem, I think, is that people don't uh, see what's, what's going on. So, you know, I also, I made the movie to accompany a lot of books and great articles that are already out there. I'm not saying anything new, um, but I think that movies uh, have a way to put a human face on things and have a real emotional impact. Um, and, you know, I, I envision it as a way to catch people up to speed in a meeting um, in about an hour to be able to have a discussion, having some sense of the, the history and the political framework for understanding the problem. Uh, I think, you know, until crucial communities most impacted by mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow develop a comprehensive framework for um, understanding the problems we face, we won't see the activism and the organization required for systemic change. And I hope that my movie is a small contribution to, to that. And even though I myself um, am, am not in the most impacted group, I've never been incarcerated. Um, and I think now's a good time for me to say um, there is a history of you know, white saviors coming in um, to communities of color with good intentions, uh, but perpetuating racist institutions and impeding self-determination of communities of color. And I'm trying not to do that. Um, I often quote an Australian Aboriginal saying that I try to live by, that is, if you have come to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So, let me acknowledge that it's a little strange that I'm the white guy up here giving the keynote address and um, while the panel afterwards consists of people of color. And let me say that part of the reason I'm up here, um, not necessarily by choices by the organizers of this event, but part of the reason I'm up here, the opportunities I've had, um, is because I'm a white male. And I hope that I can show you that I also deserve to be up here based on some of the hard work that I've been doing and I'm not just blowing wind. <laughs> um, you know, I acknowledge that I have certain privileges in a society being able-bodied, able straight, white male. I acknowledge that I'm lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had, um, and which has culminated most recently in me being able to make this film. And it's really been an amazing opportunity for me to be able to do that. And I think there's a responsibility that I have, um, being from a major majority group, to contribute to justice, real justice, uh, to solutions that our society, you know, the problems that our society faces. Um, you know, to speak truthfully to white audiences um, and the establishment, and to organize alongside my black brothers and sisters when they'll have me. So I'm sure this audience is pretty educated on these issues, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, let me go through some of the basic statistics um, about mass incarceration and racial disparities. Then I'll like to go um, a few things that were left out of my movie I want to talk about and some things that were perhaps underdeveloped in the new Jim Crow, um, Michelle Alexander's book. And let me direct you again to my website, BrokenOnAllSides.com, that has a list of resources, books, some ideas for moving forward that are good in addition to what you've been um, working with. So here in the USA, we have just 5% of the Earth's population but we have 25% of the world's prisoners. We're also the richest country in the history of the world and um, also one of the most unequal. And I think those two things, great wealth for a few and great misery and destruction for the many, uh, come hand in hand. Criminal justice is a crucial system of social control and racial control in America today. 
We have more of our people under correctional control than any other country in the history of the world, and we have the highest rates of incarceration ever in what has um, you know, been called the land of the free. The statistics say that one in every 100 adults you know will be in prison at a given time, one in 100. We have 2.3 million people behind bars and a total of 7 million um, that are under correctional control of some kind, in prison or jail, on probation, parole, halfway houses, etc. That's about 3% of the adult population in the U.S., or 1 in 30 adults. And what happens when people come out of prison? Um, is it back to normal? No, we, we've branded people with a permanent scarlet letter uh, that says society is allowed to discriminate against you for a whole host of issues, from housing to education, access to public benefits, licensing, employment, jury duty, voting rights. I worked as a lawyer trying to help people with criminal records in Philadelphia, so I saw this again and again, people coming in, and I was the main person that, that, that did this. And there's very little legally you can do um, it, it varies state to state um, dealing with these collateral consequences and it's things that even judges and juries as they're handing down sentences may not even be aware of these collateral consequences. I found judges that are extremely ignorant to some of these things. Um, we've set up invisible walls to marginalize a huge percentage of our population preventing them from re-entering the legal economy and normal life we release people from prison, often with huge fines to pay back, court costs, um, sometimes even prison services they were uh, the, you know, privy to, and people who the system has tried to break down and destroy inside prisons, and then we release them back into our communities, usually poor communities, with less skills, you know, post-traumatic stress of some kind, government condoned mental, physical, sexual abuse, and this scarlet letter of an outcast. In Detroit, I spoke on a panel after a screening of my movie, and um, on the panel with me was, was this guy, Michael Harris, who was incarcerated for 10 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. He talked about the mental torture for years of just being in a space where you have to deal every day with people who hate you. And I had never quite uh, thought of it that way myself, but you know the way the system is set up, um, the guards, administrators, are encouraged to hate those people that are, that are in cages. 60% of that population, the people in cages today, are people of color. We have more of our ethnic minorities locked up than any other nation. That includes South Africa at the height of apartheid and Israel today with the number of Palestinians imprisoned. In America, one in 36 Latino adults is behind bars, one in, black, one in 15 black adults is in prison today, compared to one in 107 white American adults. Um, most harshly affected and stigmatized are black men, and that's why my film and often my talks focus on um, black men, although women are the fastest growing segment of the prison population, um, largely for nonviolent drug offenses and you know, also immigration detention has a lot of overlap and there are other minorities that are overrepresented in, in prison that deserve attention. Um, for black males between the age of 20 and 34, one in nine is behind bars. And this creation of black criminality, and it is a creation that I'll get into later, creation of black criminal race is what drives this whole system. From the Bureau of Justice Statistics data, for every black man in the U.S. in 2001, one in six had been in prison at some point. For every black boy born today, they have a one in three chance that they'll spend some time in prison. For Latino boys, it's a one in six chance. And after you know, these hundreds of thousands of men are churned through the system, um, you know, oftentimes working for jobs that are like modern day sl slavery, getting paid a dollar a day, um, things like that. Afterwards, um, you know, they get out and will return them to segregated ghetto communities from which they came to fend for themselves. And then we wonder why there's inner city crime. You know, how does all this help public safety? How does all this help, you know, prevent crime? I think it does the opposite. 
In the 1970s, when our prison population was between 200 and 300,000, many criminal justice experts began to take the point of view that prisons create more crime than they stop, and that prisons had outlived their purpose in society. And it wasn't crazy to talk about prison abolition back then in mainstream criminal justice. Today, 40 years later, we've come to 2.3 million people. Our policies don't deter, prevent crime, they create more crime. And outside of prisons and the criminal justice system, the inequality in our society really creates first and foremost crime. And we know things like a stronger economy, um, jobs and training, living wages for people, health care, mental health, drug treatment, child care, these things you know, prevent crime. But money and resources are allocated away from these things to keep more and more of our population in cages. And the more people we keep in cages, the more racist stereotypes can persist about the cause of crime. So there's a couple of reasons I think the whole country isn't up in arms about this. Um, one, important people benefit from the system as it is, and therefore have all kinds of incentives to tell a story that keeps things going as they are. And two, um, with white people still a majority, still largely controlling society, living uh, with racist institutions that arose under white supremacy, even if some of them have been diversified, the whole system, the way we think about crime, has been racialized. Crime and the black race have been linked. And of course, we know that race has been a crucial social construction for the white rulers in society since the beginning of our country with the creation of all black slavery. Today, similarly, you know, the continuing legacy of slavery, convict leasing, black codes, Jim Crow, this new Jim Crow today means that in practice, regardless of what our laws say, a young black man is a criminal until proven innocent. Uh, and you know, a white person is not defined by any criminal act he or she commits, we can often define whites as human beings um, that have temporarily chosen the wrong thing, made a mistake. And you know, you don't hear, uh, we've got to do something about all this white crime, or, or what about all the white on white crime that we've been hearing about? And that's, that's one of the material and emotional benefits of being white in a society. You're not the target of this system. Uh, and even though you may be affected by it now and again, and more and more white people are as the system spirals out of control, um, you're not the target originally. And so one of my main points is that this inherent racist perspective, this underlying unnamed coded racism is very alive and well in America, harder to see. And that's how this carceral state, mass incarceration, is able to continue at the rates it has. Uh, some more statistics, and if it feels like I'm hammering you over the head with, you, with it, I, I am trying to do that. We really need to like, get a hold of this. Black people constitute one million, nearly half of the 2.3 million pris prisoners today, although they only make up 13% of the US population. Um, African Americans are incarcerated over five times the rate of whites nationally. Um, and in Pennsylvania, it's much, much worse. A black person here is uh, over nine times more likely to be incarcerated than a white person. For Latinos, it's also worse. It's about five and a half to one in, in Pennsylvania. So what about the collateral consequences once released? According to the Washington Post, 1.46 million black men out of a total voting population of 10.4 million have lost their right to vote due to felony convictions. According to the Sentencing Project, in Florida, Kentucky, and Virginia, one in five African Americans has been denied the fundamental right to vote because of a conviction. Now, looking at the huge population of people of color behind bars, one could say, well, you probably wouldn't say it, but one could think that, um, well, the reason these racial disparities exist is that black and Latinos commit more crimes. And they're inherently more apt to commit crime. And some people do say that. Um, and based on what we see on TV, 
what we learn in our popular culture, that seems to be a major message. Well, behavior among races is often similar based on circumstances, so it doesn't seem to explain the disparities. We know that people of all races use and sell illegal drugs at the same rates, right? That's been, we've known this for years. Blacks make up roughly 13% of the population, roughly 14% of the drug using population. But black people made up 63% of all drug offenders sent to state prisons in 1996, and whites made up only 37%. And in some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders that were sent to prison were African American. So I like to say, at what point does that not become okay? 100% is not okay, right? People would say, oh, this is a racist system. 80 to 90 percent. Numbers become even more horrifying in the juvenile justice system, where we are just starting to form an opinion about who is a criminal in society, who is not, where kids are figuring out what their role is in society. According to the Justice Policy Institute, while African American youth compromise 17 percent of the youth population in the U.S., African American youth represent 27% of all drug violation arrests and compromise 48% of the youth detained for a drug offense. Disparities exist in other crime areas as well, not just the drug war, even though behavior among races is roughly the same. According to the Center on Disease Control's annual Youth Risk Behavior Survey, African American youth report being in physical fights at a similar rate to whites, but were arrested for aggravated assault at nearly three times the rate. I spoke last week in a, a rally against the closure of 37 public schools in Philadelphia that is being handed to us by our leaders um, in Germantown. And I, in my research to talk, um, I found some more horrifying statistics about the school to prison pipeline. In a recent Department of Education study, um, in a, their sample of students that they used, 18% were students of color, yet students of color represented 40% of expulsions. And of the same sample, they looked at which students were more likely to have police called on them for discipline, disciplinary issues at school. Latino and black students represented 70% of those cases where the police were called in for disciplinary infractions. So, you know, people say, why all the black high school dropouts, um, you know, they're just lazy. They don't want to take advantage of a good education, you know, things like that. No, you have to look at the circumstances, not just the result, you have to look at the context. And don't believe all the stuff you're fed on TV, um, or movies, or gangster rap. You know, black youth are being systematically terrorized in our schools. Some of these kids are as young as five or six years old and are called for temper tantrums. Police are called in and they're handcuffed and let out. Now what does that do you know, to a child? So, skip ahead here. So we know that even if there are you know, higher rates of crime among certain racial groups, without looking at the context of the situation and only taking in stereotypes we're fed in, in popular culture, um, it could lead you to some very racist conclusions about some races' tendency towards violence or crime. Some people think it's all about poverty. So let's not talk about race, it's about, it's about poverty. Um, you know, more likely not to have access to money for basic necessities, but also for a good lawyer if you're, if you're caught up in the system. And poverty is an important part of it. Police can't target rich communities for, you know, drug busts or whatever, because they get help. Um, they can't even arrest this, you heard of the HSBC bank that basically is like the largest drug money laundering scandal in the history ever, and there's no criminal charges against anyone. So, you know, poverty means you're a target. You know, rich get a jail, get out of jail free card. Um, we know poor whites have been swept up in the drug war as well. And, and um, you know, poverty isn't the only thing though. We have to understand that the system has been designed to target people of color. The history of the system meant that it would be so. And discretion 
um, built into the system allows for unchecked racial disparities, unchecked racial biases about choosing who to target in law enforcement and prosecution. We also know that like slavery and Jim Crow, the institution of mass incarceration um, is a race-making institution, um, meaning that it defines what it means to be black in society today. And you know, to understand even more sort of the evolution of these perceptions, the evolution of the accompanying law enforcement legislation that has caused the explosion of the prison population, we have to go way back to, I think, the 1950s and 60s and look at dual crises that America was facing. And I think this is where Michelle Alexander's book sort of doesn't stress enough. And there's books like um, Lockdown America by Christian Parenti that's fabulous about talking about this. In the 1960s, we saw the dual crises of popular protests sweeping America, particularly the civil rights and the black power movements, um, which inspired many other struggles after that. And then secondly, the ongoing economic crisis at the time, the decline in profitability after the post-war boom. So after World War II and um, Europe had literally been destroyed and American companies did not have rivals, did not have global competition. But by the late 50s, 60s, Europe has rebuilt itself and so it starts to eat into American um, owners' profits. So there's a social crisis and an economic crisis. And you have ruling powers in this country trying to figure out how to deal with this. People in power trying to figure out how to deal with this. And they are concerned with the growing unrest at home. And they're also concerned about adapting the American economy to continuing making money for corporations and the rich. And a lot of these industrial jobs outsourcing, first moving to maybe non-labor or non-union um, states where cheaper labor in the South, and then eventually moving overseas. Um, and there, you know, people in power saw connection with the need to deal with this new urban population that was losing jobs in the ghetto, good paying jobs, uh, and were at the forefront of these dangerous uprisings that were going on you know, dangerous for the ruling elite in this country. Um, you know, these were the struggles of African Americans and whenever African Americans in this country have fought back against oppression, against the system, it has inspired others to do the same. So nipping this, nipping the civil rights and black power movement was very important for the powers that be. Um, and remember, you know, you were at the point where cities are literally burning down in this country and, you know, it, third world revolutions going on and then places like France you have one-fourth of workers out on strike and so it's not just the third world it's industrialized countries people fearing that it would come to America too so this is this is you know we're real serious problems and um, that's sort of the perfect storm for the conditions of this ramp up of law enforcement and law and order rhetoric and prison expansion and on top of it you have this strategy that you may have heard of called the Southern Strategy, which was developed by the Republican Party. And that's really the icing on the cake. And now a little bit about the Southern Strategy. The Democratic Party had always been the stronghold of racists, white racists in the South, the Dixiecrats. But they were in power in the 60s and you know with all that was going on lyndon johnson a dixiecrat himself was forced to sign in lots of very progressive civil rights legislation in, into power implement the war on poverty um, that really helped millions of african americans and the republicans were developing a strategy that could steal away the white base from the south that had historically been you know the dixiecrat uh, base and we have a glimpse of the implications of this from one of Nixon's Richard Nixon's top aides H.R. Haldeman who wrote in his diary about Nixon's reaction to the uprisings of the 60s and 70s He said quote Nixon emphasized you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to This is his uh, his uh, top aide so the Republicans had to devise a strategy that could take advantage of the lingering racist sentiment, fear of racial progress, and some legitimate fears of poor white people in the South about what their own future was in a deteriorating economy, you know, jobs being lost there as well. 
and they had to find a voice for these feelings in an era when it was no longer okay to be an open racist. Um, segregation was no longer okay, and discrimination in many areas were outlawed. And it's around this time you start to hear politicians painting the movement for black rights as, as unlawful mobs, um, and it became okay to criticize the tactics of the movement without being a racist, you know, saying, uh, we want, you know, a res restoration of law and order, and you, you wouldn't say, you know, segregationist things anymore, but you could easily disagree with the tactics. And that really is the beginning of this law and order rhetoric that we now have mainstream in this country. And it was an incredibly successful tactic, and it worked. And, um, you know, Lyndon Johnson himself, I think, it admitted that as, as he's signing civil rights legislation into law, he's like, there, we just lost the South, you know. And, you know, maybe some people who are old enough to live through this can talk about, um, you know, these experiences, because I'm just reading this in the, in the history books. Um, so, you know, of course, this rhetoric has continued and morphed, and the farther away we get from segregation, the less we see the connection. And, um, you know, we have the crackdown on welfare queens, which really means black women committing crimes by mooching off the system. But you could just say, well, you know, Reagan could just say welfare queen, and we knew what he meant. The fear of violence around the so-called crack e epidemic in the 80s, where the Reagan White House unleashed a PR campaign about this new black drug and the extreme black violence it induced, and a whole new, you know, propaganda around black criminality began in the same sense that a pop popular culture ar arose around um, stereotypes of African Americans under Jim Crow, we have a new era of popular culture stereotypes that have arisen around black criminality. Um, I'm almost done and happy to hand it over to our, to our panelists. Um, so uh, let me just lastly say that you know, this, is, this is a Republican and a Democratic problem. The largest part of this ramp up was under the Clinton administration, where you see these horrible three strikes laws, um, expansion of the death penalty, um, you know, encouraging public housing in different states to discriminate against uh, drug, conviction, drug convicts for the rest of their lives, um, even having it to the point where if you're convicted of a drug crime, you can't go and stay with your mom in public housing because she risks eviction. Um, I mean, on and on these, these collateral consequences that are illustrated very well in The New Jim Crow, the book The New Jim Crow. And of course, you know, with all these law and order ramp up, three strikes you're out, mandatory minimums, that's how we got to, you know, from 230,000 to 2.3 million um, today. And so, you know, I think that we have to rearrange priorities in this society, that, you know, it's, it's about saying, you know, do we need to lock down millions and millions of people to keep ourselves safe, or are there better ways to stop crime and to create public safety? Um, you know, does closing down 37 public schools in Philadelphia help crime any? Um, you know, Governor Corbett is also spending $600 million to build new prisons in Pennsylvania. So again, hand in hand, this is what happens. You close schools, you need to build more prisons. And you know, how do we defeat this current system? I think everyone here will hopefully speak to that. I have a lot of ideas about that. And let me end with this. It's daunting, okay? Like I wanna hammer you over the head with these statistics, but like think about the history and read the history of social movements in this country, the founding of this country, the end of slavery, the defeat of Jim Crow, the women's movement, ending you know, the Vietnam War. How did all that stuff happen? It wasn't voting the right guy into office. It wasn't you know, getting the right petition signed or click here on this Facebook page. You know, it was massive organizing in the streets, in schools, in churches, in workplaces. And we have to do that again today. That's what we have to do. I agree with Michelle Alexander. We need a new civil rights movement. And we are at the beginning of it. And traveling around the country, it's, it's so awesome to see people like this, people like you, this is happening all over the country. And you know, there's not gonna be news stories about it right now, but people are starting to get it. And the people who are most impacted 
are taking charge and trying to organize. And so I would encourage people like you to support them, to work with them, and to try and find ways to get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We'll now have our panelists. Each one of them will have 10 minutes. Uh, our first panelist is Tyrone Wirtz. Tyrone Wirtz is a consultant in the Philadelphia Public Defenders Association as a public relations consultant to <clears throat> Temple's Inside Out of Prison Exchange Program, which takes college students inside prisons to examine crime and justice issue along with the inmates. He's also the chairman of the Lifers Public Safety Initiative and serves on the Mayor's Commission of African American Males. In 1975, Tyrone Wirtz was convicted as an accomplice to a second degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. On December 30th, 2010, after serving 36 years at the State Correction Institution in Graterford, Wirtz's life sentence was commuted by the former governor, Ed Rendell, a testament to this longstanding dedication of justice reform and developing solutions to the criminal justice concerns in the United States. Jerome? now. <laughs> I mean, followed behind Matt is like, they should put us on first and let, let Matt clean, us, clean everything up for us. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you so much for um, having me here this afternoon uh, to speak to you. Uh, I don't know what I can say this, that uh, is any different than what uh, Matt had to say, except maybe uh, my personal experience. Um, as um, the speaker said, um, I spent close to 37 years in Greenford Prison. Um, and I, March 14th actually would be two years since I've been home. And um, I just want to say life is wonderful. Woo! <laughs> and I also want to thank Matt uh, because I met Matt um, uh, you know, when I got out of prison and I had opportunity to uh, watch this film. And I just thought uh, how relevant was this film, especially from someone who had went into the prison um, this prison system in 1975, and I've seen the transition from, um, in, in specifically in Pennsylvania, I can talk very uh, profoundly about Pennsylvania's prison uh, system because, you know, when I first went in, there were like seven state prisons, uh, there were 5,000 prisoners all across the state, um, there were about 500 men and women serving life without parole, and the budget was about $150 million uh, when I went in. Um, when I got out, when I walked out of Greenford March 14, 2011, there were 28 prisons, and as Matt said, our governor is investing $600 million into building three more and $75 million per year to operate those three new prisons. And uh, there are 52,000 prisoners and about 5,000 men and women serving life without parole sentences. And, uh, and so those numbers seem very uh, like abstract. Like abstract um, but actually, uh, Matt talked a little bit about the, the, the collateral consequences. I think that is the major, major uh, consequence of this uh, focus on uh, uh, punishment and social control using law enforcement and the criminal justice system. It has done enormous damage to um, urban communities, communities from where a lot of us come from. I mean, I've seen it um, where you have these generations of uh, men serving time. I mean, I was in Gradyford with two sets of grandfather, father, and grandson, you know what I mean? And, um, and it just, it's just perpetuating a system that is um, uh, leaving thousands, literally thousands, a million across the country, millions of children without fathers and mothers, which slowly, again, breaks down the, 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 the social fabric of our communities. And so, um, 
And, and you know, I've been so involved, and in, even when I was in prison, um, and I have some great friends sitting over in the corner, they might not want to identify themselves, but uh, uh, we, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, over a, 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 a period of 30 years, we've always been actively involved in trans, um, um, changing and reforming the criminal justice system because we knew early on, as we seen the influx of younger and younger uh, people for minor and minor crimes, um, uh, that we knew that this was slowly um, doing uh, very destructive things to our community. And so, um, so I really welcome this opportunity to talk about a lot of these issues uh, because, uh, as Matt said, and we really need a new social movement in this country uh, to talk about what are we doing to um, uh, marginalized communities in, in this country, how we are slowly um, destroying the next generation of uh, young black and, and, and Latino uh, children that's coming up because of the, the uh, mandatory uh, sentences and a long uh, uh, term incarceration. And you know, for me, it, it's no, you know, when I was glad Matt gained a little history about um, uh, President Nixon, President Reagan, and uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, because all of that is so really relevant to what's going on today. And and you know, I know I know a lot of people want to deal with conspiracy theories, but I, sometimes I really have to sit back and wonder. You know, when Ronald Reagan was on the front end of changing a lot of laws so that a, a lot of companies can move their jobs overseas, and I don't, I couldn't understand why would anyone in this country be willing to give people tax breaks to move jobs overseas. And I know up in Pennsylvania where you have steel mills, coal mines, manufacturing, when a lot of those companies begin to move out, those, those companies, really, those communities are really devastated in terms of economically. And then Reagan gets on TV and, and starts this black criminalization, criminalization of black people, and then we see this, this massive uh, building campaign of prisons up in, uh, up in these areas. And, and, it's, and it's, you may just, just you know, just thinking with common sense. I mean, you have to wonder, uh, at, at the same time that a lot of these laws, mandatory minimums and um, um, the drug laws and the war on crime and, uh, and, and war on drugs and those kind of things, and we had this huge influx of, uh, of building prisons. And just one last thing. Just before I left Bradenton, uh, because like I said, in Pennsylvania, we are building three more prisons. $600 million when we close it down, 27 schools in, in, in Philadelphia. You know, up around the country, New York, Illinois, Michigan, Virginia, are actually closing prisons. Uh, and just to you, tell you how, you know, how crazy this seemed, when I, just before I left Greater, they had shipped a thousand men from uh, prisons in Pennsylvania over to Michigan. And they sent another thousand to Virginia. Now, the only way Virginia and Michigan would have space to take these thousand individuals if they had saw the, the folly of their uh, criminal justice policy begin to close down prisons and had the space. And so, of course, um, you think about the convict leasing system, hmm, hmm, that's a whole nother discussion. You know what I mean? So, um, so it's those kind of things that kind of give one's pause and really points to the fact that we really need to, um, and it's not just the people you know, most people think that because black people are mostly affected by this, that we should be the ones. No, we, as Americans, we all should be really horrified at what's going on in this country because as, as this is affecting the black community and black children and the school districts in, in Philadelphia, eventually, I mean, in Pennsylvania, eventually it's going to spread out and begin to affect um, um, more suburban uh, areas in, in, in the country as a whole. So as Matt said, um, we are, all of us are in a struggle to not only change the dynamic that's going on in our communities, but we also are heavily involved in um, de de uh, decarcerating uh, uh, Pennsylvania and prisons across this country. And this is not a, a, a singletary fight. We, we need everybody's help. Uh, I like to call it all hands on deck if we want to save you know, our country from the uh, foolish policies that we are presently um, functioning on. So thank you very much.
Hakeem, Hakeem Ali is an activist with the Decasserate Pennsylvania and the Public Relations and Outreach Coordinator with Reconstruction Inc., which seeks to build communities in Philadelphia where people are proud to live in and by reestablishing a sense of shared community life through collective work, individual responsibility, and mutual respect. Mr. Alley was incarcerated several times during his life, starting at age 14. Uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, thank you uh, here at Mainline Unitarian Church for allowing myself and the rest of us to come in and share our stories and uh, attempt to give you some information uh, about what's going on in the criminal justice system, uh, the racist environment that we live in as a people, and hopefully some ideas about change, which I think is the most important part of this whole uh, uh, event that we're having here. This is not a pity party, okay? And sometimes people get it jammed up and they think that we get up and talk about the conditions that exist that we whine and we cry and it's a pity party. It's actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually uh, facts that are being relayed to you. Let me get that water. And secondly, before I continue, let me apologize. I'm gonna have a very difficult time staying 10 minutes. I run my mouth, all right? So you need to be aware of that. I talk. So Bert is going to have, probably have to throw something at me to get me away from this podium here, all right? Uh, there's several things that I'm going to make reference to. But first, there were some things that were shared with you about who I am. I think I should share a little bit more. Uh, he introduced me as Hakeem Ali. Uh, you look at my dress, you see the kufi. So you can gather that I'm Muslim. I'm also a father, a grandfather. He mentioned that I was an activist. I'm also a poet. I'm a former offender, and I'm a returned citizen, something that we're going to talk about in a minute. In 2003, I was released back into the community after serving almost 40 years in state and federal institutions. So therefore, I spent over two thirds of my life incarcerated. That in and of itself is a crime. You know, I didn't murder nobody. I did, I robbed some banks, you know, I carried pistols, I stole cars, I did a lot of devastating things in my community, but I didn't murder nobody. And the way the law is here, you spend that kind of time in the penitentiary when you take somebody's life. That's one part of it. So, you may pose a question to me about me being up here on this panel and speaking to you and hopefully responding to questions that you're going to ask. You know, well, who the heck are you, a convict, ex-convict, criminal, who are you that we should pose questions to about the criminal justice system? You ain't got no degree. You ain't spent years and years of study. You haven't been through uh, a bachelor's, master's program. And my response to you is that, who am I? To know I know everything. Spend 40 years, 37 years, 20 years, 10 years, five years, have a family member that's been in for that kind of time, then you are in fact an expert in the criminal justice system. And you don't need PhD behind your name. You live the life. Your family member has lived the life. You can speak to it in a manner that no academic will ever be able to speak to it. And it's our obligation and our duty, each and every time an extended invitation is given to us, to come out and speak to it in the manner that we are going to speak to it. I'm going to try not to get upset. <laughs> I can't guarantee it, but I'm going to try not to. Undoubtedly, being incarcerated for such a long time, and no doubt Tyrone can speak to this too, 
we've seen some of the most horrible things on the face of this earth happen in the penitentiaries. We've seen people being abused and killed in manners that is unspeakable. Why in the world will we come out and not try to do something about that? No man, woman, or child. This is 2013, and I'm talking about children. Josh undoubtedly is going to speak to this. Suffering that kind of stuff. No child should be exposed to that. Who are we that we allow children to be exposed to this nonsense? There's three groups that I primarily work with. One, Reconstruction Incorporated. And our good chairperson, stand up, Will. You know I was put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Who has been involved with this type of work years upon years upon years and is the founder of Reconstruction Incorporated. So what is Reconstruction? If you don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about all three of these programs and then in, in response to questions, I can give you more details. Reconstruction Incorporated is what we view as the art of developing by changing ourselves in order to change the world by uniting the many to defeat the few. That, that is our political position. And everything that this group and this organization does is based on that. And so I want to make a, a reference to something that uh, uh, I love Matt. Now, don't get me twisted here. You know, I think Matt is one of the, the pioneers in regards to dealing with issues like this. But he made a comment. And the comment that he made was that the majority versus the minority. And the reference is that black people is the minority. And that's a fallacy. That's a lie. If you put us in a contingent in a small area, like America, then maybe we might fall into that category. But this is a global issue. This is a global issue. And we are far from being the minority in a global issue. We are the majority. And sooner or later, people need to start thinking that way. And when you start thinking about majority, you start thinking that you got power. And when you start thinking and believing you have power, you act differently than you do as a minority with no power. So I encourage all of us, those who are in fact of African descent and those who in fact are concerned about people of African descent, start looking at us as the majority and seeing how you can blend in. There's three programs primarily that Reconstruction functions, functions under, and these programs exist in the curriculum that it in fact outlines. And I had a few copies of this one page document that talks about what the curriculum is and I put it on the table. I kind of held on to them because <laughs> when the service was over, it was a multitude of people out there. And I only had like about 20, 25 copies. I said, man, I ain't putting them out now. I won't be able to charge those that stay go get a copy. So now I'm charging you when you leave out it, go on the table and get a copy. And the curriculum is this, it's based with three things. First, a leadership development. It's called leadership development curriculum. And I'm not gonna talk about what each one of the things do because it would take my whole 10 minutes. And I know Brett gonna throw something at me now. But the second one is called situation management and the third one is called support group development. All three of those things, part of the curriculum that this organization does are key factors in helping men, women, and children, once they come home, to stay home. Once they come home, to reunite with their families. Once they come home, to reunite in their communities. Once they come home, to be able to stand up and take a position about what's going on in their lives and in the lives of those that they love. The second group that I'm involved in is called Decarcerate PA. <laughs> You heard that term a couple of times from both the speakers that was up here before me. Decarcerate. Everybody know what incarcerate mean, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, I want to hear it now. I want you to just, <laughs> everybody going to sleep on me. 
you know? So decarcerate is just the opposite of that. And there's a group, Josh is a part of it, Theresa is a part of it, Matt is a part of it, which is called Decarcerate PA. And our efforts in that group is to, in fact, right now, to stop, to stop Governor Corbett from building those two institutions out on greater first ground that people have been talking about. That's right. Not only is it our intentions to do it, there's already been activities and actions on a multitude of levels to do that. The most latest and the most devastating to them was back in uh, a couple months ago when we had people go out to the site, put up desks in front of the place where the machines and the trucks to go in and built a makeshift schoolhouse, put signs all over the place and literally stopped them from coming in that particular time period on that day. And several of them got arrested and they actually going to trial for that particular incident then, okay? Another thing that happened is that when a good old, my man Corbett, comes into town on a regular basis, and this one opportunity came in to speak at the uh, museum, and uh, we had a contingent of nice folks there, you know, and they interrupted him to the point where he had to cut his whole program 30, 40 minutes short and left out the back door. And we made it known to him that each and every time he steps his feet in Philadelphia, we're going to be there. And we're going to challenge him about putting $655 odd million dollars in prison construction and closing all these schools and taking $500 million away from education development in this state. Is he going crazy? He has. I like that. <laughs> he has absolutely lost his mind. But it's all part of a plan. So he ain't really crazy. He's doing what the plan calls for. Matt outlined it in terms of historical perspective. So we gonna rumble them. And lastly, there's a group more recently that was developed that's called Exit Us. <clears throat> this group uh, is very young in this development. A uh, young man, Thomas Ford, who just recently came home himself, uh, laid the blueprint for it. And what it stands for is this, Ex-Offenders in Transition slash Urban Society, E-X-I-T slash U-S, okay? And the primary uh, purpose of this particular group is so that we determine what our priorities are. We determine what freedom is. We establish that. Nobody establishes what freedom is for us. We do it ourselves. Before I close out, I want to read some things. I like to run my mouth first and say what I got to say, as opposed to starting off saying what somebody else has to say. But before I leave you, I do want to share with you something that some other people have to say. First, there was a quote I read in the New York Times. I'm going to ask you to bear with me. It says, how mass incarceration affects communities, prison as a poverty trap. The shift to tougher penalty policies three decades ago, Matt gave you some history, was credited with helping people in poor neighborhoods by reducing crime. Now that the US incarcerated rate has risen to the world's highest, Social scientists find the social benefits are far outweighed by the cost to those communities. Prison has become the new poverty trap. It has become a routine event for poor African American men and their families, creating an enduring disadvantage at the very bottom of American society. Among African Americans, who have grown up during the era of mass incarceration, one in four has a parent locked up at some time, at some point, during that person's childhood. One in four. Secondly, and this is a little brief piece I pulled off a, a speech by Michelle Alexander that, and I tell you, I, I, I really love that sister. But Michelle Alexander ain't saying nothing new. And what happens when, when Matt was up here saying that because he's a 
he's a white man, and the kind of privileges and opportunities that's afforded to him as a white man dealing with these issues that's not necessarily afforded to other people, well, she ain't white. And she's a woman, not a man, but she's well-educated. She's well-educated, okay? And being well-educated in her history of being a lawyer, his history of being a lawyer, and delving into that area that's really important because the law is the trickiest thing on the face of this earth. So getting involved with the law, understanding it, knowing it, being able to speak to things that normally we scratch our heads and don't understand it. So I'm gonna read a little thing here. It says, this memo is intended to provide a brief outline of her thoughts about building a movement to end mass incarceration of poor people of color. A movement that would hopefully forge a new moral consciousness and consensus about how we as a nation ought to respond to poor people of color in the United States. If we are successful, the new public conscience and consensus will be rooted in compassion, fairness, and dignity for all. I'm gonna stop there. Fairness and dignity for all. And I know you want to applaud for me, sweetheart. I love you. <laughs> but let me say this in leaving, and, and, I, and, and I'm an open book. Uh, be careful what you ask me because my answer might not be what you want to hear. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Shoatz. Uh, she's an activist and a leader at the Human Rights Coalition in Philadelphia. Her, her father, Russell Maroon Shoetz, who's 69 years old, was arrested in 1972 at age 29. As of July 2012, her father has been held unbelievably in solitary confinement for 30 years. 21 years of them consecutive years at the State Correctional Institution uh, Green in Western Pennsylvania. Teresa. Oh. Yeah, my name is actually um, Teresa Schultz, and um, I am 49 years of age. So with the stats that, um, the information that was just given to you, I've been going into prisons for 40 years just to visit this one person, my father. I, um, in the beginning I thought prison was such a nice, well kept, um, the landscape was beautiful because it was in a rural area where I was visiting my dad in Pennsylvania. And it wasn't until I started seeing the guards treat senior citizens bad that were visiting. And if they didn't have a proper ID, they would be turned away after driving some hours or making big preparations to visit a prison. Um, with the stigma that went along with prisons back then, people really didn't want to go visit their loved ones in prison. So then to get turned away, meant that those people may never return again to see that loved one behind bars, which it has been shown that a prisoner who's um, visited by family members or loved one do better once they are released. Um, my mother hid the prison from us uh, about my dad. And we're talking 40 years ago. So she was very ashamed of it. And in the black community, even to this day, we have this thing where people said, if your, if your father or loved one is prison, that he went off to school, or he's in a boxing camp, or he's somewhere outside of being in prison. So 40 years ago, my mother was very ashamed. I uh, grew up on a block where I attended the elementary school right across the street from my house. So when there was a police issue with my dad, the police would come to our home and every kid in the school would be evacuated. And I was the only kid in that school who had a loved one in prison. Um, that's not as rare today. 
uh, most kids are affected by the prison system. But I was ashamed and I, I didn't have anyone to talk to, nor were there people speaking out against the prison system at that time. Also, when I went in around that time, um, there were, there were a, a more of a um, system to produce a better image one that's to be released to our community in the future. Because no one wants a prisoner coming home that's bitter. We, in my community, we won't, don't want that. You don't want that in yours either. Uh, so there were educational programs. Um, there you could get a, uh, a bachelor's degree and you could go on beyond that. I can remember Morgan State offering uh, bachelor degrees, and many prisoners took the advantage of this. Um, I can tell you that, because uh, I'm just going to hit some points, uh, that um, the educational programs are gone today. Now, when you talk about a governor that wants to close 37 schools, you can best believe there's nothing in the prison system to educate a prisoner. Um, I want you to also think about this. You may not be affected by having a loved one in prison, but you're footing that tax bill. You're footing the prison expansion. That 600 plus million, you have a hand in that. You are helping me as a taxpayer. My dad's been there 40 years. I've been helping to contribute to that. I feel awful about that. I'm forced to help expand prisons that I know are no good. Um, I also <laughs> want to talk about um, the government we presently live in don't give a darn about women nor children. Uh, we have a government now that don't even want folks to have proper medical insurance. So they could care less about kids or people who are in prison. Um, I want to ask you another thing outside of your paying taxes. Do you feel safer? Especially with almost two plus, two million people, do you feel safer? Do you feel at any time that um, you won't be assault, assaulted by someone with an AK-7, whatever gun, these automatic guns that are being used now to gun down innocent folks? You could be at a movie theater. You have children in their classrooms where we feel like our kids are safe in school. No, no. So even with all those folks in prison, I don't feel any safer. So that means that this prison system is not working. That's just the bottom line. Nor is our government to take guns off the street. Because when we talk about these innocent babies recently gunned down, uh, I see that all the time in the black community. Um, it has hit an area now where black folks are exposed to gun violence, but now people are using assault weapons outside of the black community in rural white areas and just white areas anywhere on the street. I, I, I don't feel safe. So I don't feel like this justice system that we have is working. Um, my father is going to be 70 years of age, and he's been a big supporter of young guys who come inside the prison system and asking them to make a change in their life, to not return back to their community as the same person, and he's done a fabulous job. He is very much so a father figure to a lot of prisoners that are in prison. I know there's Richard Carter is here today who spent time in prison who was influenced by my father. And he's working, are you on your law, working on a uh, degree to become a lawyer. So my father has played a major role. And it's one of the reasons why he's been kept in solitary confinement for 30, 20 plus years. It's because the system that we believe will rehabilitate really doesn't. And they really don't want that to get out to the normal folks. My dad is inside trying to rehabilitate, mm -hmm. uh, yet he's being punished for it. Mm -hmm. 
every time he does a good deed or educate a prisoner on their history or not to return to prison, he's been kept in solitary confinement where he has no voice. He's let out once a day, one hour, into a dog fence cage where there's no one to talk to. Um, he's only allowed three showers a week, three pair of socks, three underwear. He has a cement slab bed where he's constantly on every visit that I'm able to see him. He's sniffing, he's sneezing, and the cells are cold and very uncomfortable. Um, prison today is big business. It's so big. Uh, it's, a, it's a big prison bubble, but we can burst that bubble. It's gonna take you, it's gonna take me, it's gonna take everyone to stop the expansion, to stop the growth, to stop the greed around locking up people and even children. We are finding that even here in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, four years ago, I, at SCI Green, the prison my dad is at, my dad was complaining about being cold, and if the people who know me know that, I fight hard for my dad. Um, and so I called the prison, and what was happening is that 20 boys in their 20s had hung themselves in solitary confinement less than two, three years. Now, my dad has been in 23-hour lockdown for 20-plus years, but you take a young kid coming off the street, and this is mixed, it's black and white, kids that are killing themselves in solitary confinement. You're talking about forcing a kid to be alone with himself, in his brain, unlimited time where you don't know what to do with yourself. Uh, if you look at our generation now, we're so hooked, our kids on technology. Can you imagine putting a kid in a cell without a cell phone or Facebook? Uh, it's devastating. So with that number of youth killing itself, they had to re-ramp the heating system at SCI Graydon Prison to make sure people are unable to hang themselves. And then closing, it's such a big business that I know you heard here in Pennsylvania that uh, two judges were court for selling prison, prisoners, I mean selling youth, juveniles, to a juvenile center onto prison. Some of these kids, and these were mostly white kids, were saying, I didn't even do nothing. I might have said a bad word. I might have did some graffiti or something, but Judge Michael Conahan and Judge Mark C. C. Rivera. I don't know what the outcome was of those judges, but I'm hoping that they experience the same injustice that those kids experience. Um, prison is big on now that I visit, and this is my 40th year, on dehumanizing family members. Now all of a sudden you're going to do a good deed to visit this family member to make sure he goes back to that cell where he's not bitter, um, there's less trouble with a visit, and I've seen 70 year old women turned away because their ID didn't make, or their driving license was outdated. So not only are we patted down, um, that baby that I have here, um, he would be patted down, diaper checked and everything. Uh, we're also, our hands are rubbed, our clothes are rubbed for drugs. Now, what I've seen also with that is you could be, and I don't do drugs, I don't even smoke a cigarette, but I tested positive because my shirt I have been at McDonald's. My dad is seven hours away from my home, so we travel quite a distance. Uh, what can happen is just different fibers of lint or just even perspiration can set up a drug uh, test. Or money. Or money, right. Could you transfer the money and you get a notch that says this is a strike against you. And you can get a number of so those strikes where you're not allowed in the prison anymore. Now, I did hear one guard recently say, go wash your hands again. But that was just that one guard. It's so many guards that will say, you're out of here. Sorry. Uh, no, there's no one you can talk to. And um, so with this government that don't care about women or children, think about my dad is approaching 70. And I've been on some fights against the prison system and their medical system. He's in need of cataract surgery now. 
uh, they did one surgery last year and they said he got one good eye, he can't get the other cataract surgery done. I said, what? I said, I want to see those directives. It is in the directives that if you need cataract, we'll give you one eye, but you got to live with the other eye just cloudy because you got one good eye now. So you're supposed to be like Superman. When you're in the prison system under their medical condition, right. I fought months for my dad to get. Most black men are suffering with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. I fought four months, two visits to our governor office just to get a PSA blood exam. Two visits to my governor office, and when they finally gave it to him, thank God he only had a prostate infection. But another prisoner who had been waiting five years for that same blood exam went out on a visit with my dad and it was discovered he already had prostate cancer. He's dead now. So this fight is going to take a major fight and we must commit. I want to thank you all for having us in here, accepting my baby in, because so many people were so nice to me outside. I seen my neighborhood kind of running amok, so I started taking in foster kids. And this month is my first year, February, and I've had eight kids in my home. Three teenagers and one day. So, when you see some wrong, then you gotta make a change. That's Stand right. up and make the change. Mm. Woo. Our last speaker, Joshua Glenn, is 24 years old, is working with the Campaign for Nonviolent Schools, and is an organizer with the Youth Arts and Self Empowerment Group in Philadelphia. Mr. Glenn was incarcerated at age 16 after being charged as an adult for aggravated assault. Quote, I needed to get money, so I chose to sell drugs. I didn't have any guidance, he said. He spent 18 months in prison until the charges were dismissed. Josh? Oh. I've spoken at a lot of places, so, you know, I'm kind of used to it now. Um, but, you know, I just really want to touch base about the, the work that I'm doing, and I'm just going to give you all a brief background of, you know, what I've been through and, you know, how I got involved in this organization or, or the organizations that I work for, because I work for more than one. Um, well, first off, I'll just give you a background about for me. Um, I was locked up in charge as an adult at the age of 16, frankly, so um, my case was eventually dismissed. Um, I, I was held in adult prison pre-trial, so I wasn't even convicted for 18 months. And um, I remember my lawyer, I had a public defender, he was like, um, he was like, yeah, man, the case, you're gonna lose, so you should take a deal. And I said, what? I was like, first of all, I'm not taking a deal, because I already discussed it with him that I wouldn't, because I didn't do it. But he was like, you have to take a deal. And I said, well, what's the deal? He said, 11 after 23 months, you can get out today. You can have 18 months in it. But the thing he didn't tell me, he didn't tell me that I would have an adult record and that, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to get a job and, you know, having an angry assault on my record would really hurt my future. But, you know, he didn't have to tell me that because, you know, me being smart, I said, you know what, no, I don't want to take a deal. I told you I didn't do it, so I'm not going. He said, okay, well, we're going to go to trial and we're going to lose. This is what he told me right before we walked in the courtroom. I said, okay, let's go to trial. And I already went to the law library because they gave you a little brief time in the law library, so I was going to study myself. And, had my little, uh, my little folder with my, my, uh, my law study stuff in there. So I was like, I'm ready to go try for myself and if that's what I have to, have to do. But I didn't tell him that. That's what I was thinking. So we go into the courtroom and the judge says, well, what's going on? We don't have a witness. This guy been here for 18 months. Don't have anything on this guy. You have to let him go. And I'm like, what? what's going on? I'm shocked. And I'm sitting right next to my, my public defender. I'm looking at him like, are you serious? And it's just like, then they got my case up and I go home with nothing, no record, no anything, I'm free. And yeah, it's, 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 a, happy, it's a happy situation, but it's bad too, because any other young person would have took that deal. Yeah, yeah. Any, and that's what happens. Most of the 99% of cases in Philadelphia, they, they, they are ended in plea deals. 
And if you, you have a young person, these are young people that can't speak with their parents before a child. Can't speak with anybody, you're an adult. They treat you like an adult, so you have to deal with anything, anything your, your, your public defender, your lawyer tell you is on you and him. So you give a young person the room to, you know, make his own decisions as an adult. And he says, yeah, well, you know, you can get out today, let him have 23 months, you can get out today. Any young person would have took that. But, you know, I was smarter than that, and, you know, I really stood for what I believed in. And I knew, you know, yeah, I did 18 months. I wanted to go home. I go, of course I wanted to go home, but it's just like, you know, I stood up for myself and I said, no, I'm not just taking anything, and you're not just going to do me any type of way. You know, I'd rather stay in this whole time and do all, and just, just, just wait out my case instead of me playing out. So, you know, but, you know, after that, when I was locked up, I started working with this group called the Youth Arts and Final Project. And they came in and they did art and poetry workshops. And then they, they uh, basically gave us knowledge about the system and how it's designed and structural violence and mass incarceration. And, and you know, that's what really helped me. Honestly, if I didn't get that information and I didn't get that knowledge, I probably would have took the deal. Because I probably wouldn't knew about the system. You know what I mean? And then once I learned about the system, I learned about all these different things. I learned about lawyers. I learned about, you know, how the system's designed for people to go get locked up and take deals and, you know, be in the system. So that's what really helped me not take the deal, really. And, but, you know, just working with them, when I got out, you know, and I, I'm a poet too, so I, I just do poetry and they invited me out to this event and I went out to the event and I, I uh, performed some poetry that I made, that I made in the workshops. And then they, they offered me a job to work with the organization, the Youth Arts Self Empowerment Project. So, you know, I've been working with them ever since. And that was in, I got out in 2007. So I've been working with the, the, this organization the whole time. But when, when I first got out, the organization was really only art and poetry workshops. That's all they really provided, plus political education. That was it. When I got out, we sat down with me and a couple other young people that were locked in charge of adults that were in with me. And we sat down and we thought about, well, what can we do to help young people change? What do they need? So we brainstormed a lot of stuff and we thought about, one, they need jobs. Two, they need guidance. Three, they need education about the system. So then we created an organization that, you know, we employ young people part-time when they're, when they're getting locked up. When, well, young people that are charged with adults, we employ them part-time and we get them political education. And we also help them and give them room to challenge the system that allows them to be charged with adults. So then we, we, we created that whole thing and that whole organization. And now, you know, we have an organization where we employ young people part-time. We still go and do art and poetry workshops every weekend, but our main base is the young people that are locked in charge of adults, we employ them when they come out. And then, you know, we, we help them challenge Act 33. Act 33 is a law that allows youth to be automatically in charge of adults in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we have a petition, we go door to door, we do a lot of different events, and we work with a lot of different other groups. And um, we just go door to door and get people to sign our petition, and we actually give them information about young people being charged of adults and how it is and how it impacts our communities. Because it do impact our communities. I mean, young people be charged with adults. One, this is a young person from 15 to 18. And even it could be even lower depending on the charges. But young people, before 1996, young people couldn't be automatically charged with adults for anything but murder. But in 1996, they changed it so young people would be charged for anything that could be considered a violent crime. And the DA had the discretion to, you know, say what's a violent crime, what's not. So, you know, sometimes I've seen young people that were locked up for a fight in school somebody got hurt a little bit bad, and then they said, all right, we charge him as an adult, and he has to await trial in adult prison, and it wasn't right. I actually had a celly that, that went through that. So, you know, um, so basically, we just, we, we work with young people, and we empower them to be leaders in the communities, and we tell them about, you know, young people being charged with adults, and all of those things, and we tell them about the system so that they can know what the system is, how it impacts our communities for youth being charged with adults, and so we can change it. And so, you know, we work with a lot of young people, and we go out, we go to different schools, and we do workshops about structural violence, the school prison pipeline, and young people being charged with adults. And we have a documentary we created called Stolen Dreams to impact the charge of youth as adults. And we go to different schools and we uh, show it, and then we do interactive workshops afterwards so that young people can know about young people being charged with adults and structural violence in the school prison pipeline. Um, but I also work with another coalition called uh, Campaign for Nine Miles Schools, and uh, we're, 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 we're a coalition of youth-led organizations that are working to end violence in the Philadelphia school system. 
And when, when I say violence, I'm not talking about physical violence because we believe that structural violence is, it, it, it basically creates physical violence. And um, so we go around and we're basically trying to make the schools better by, you know, pointing out what structural violence is and, you know, different policies that they put in place in school basically create structural violence. You know, like they uh they have all types of policies where young people don't get second chances and you know you get expelled, like uh, Matt was talking about. You know, there's a lot of different policies in the Philadelphia public schools that you know that forces young people and push them out of school, and that's that's a form of school prison pipeline, but it's also a form of structural violence. And this is a lot of bad conditions that young people have to you know undergo to learn. Like a lot of young people in Philadelphia schools, they have close to thirty something students in one classroom one teacher, you know what I mean, that's, that's hard to learn. It's hard for a teacher to teach 30 something students in one classroom. And we point those things out and, and let young people know that's a form of structural violence and we tell them what they can do to change it. Mm -hmm. um, I also worked with the Carceral PA. And the Carceral PA, I don't know how he, he basically said what it was and defined it very well. But uh, we're just a, a, a coalition of organizations and individuals that's working in mass incarceration in Pennsylvania. And you know, we, we, we've been fighting against the prison expansion in uh, Montgomery County. They're trying to build three new prisons. What's what two new prisons now? They actually built one, but they're trying to build two new prisons and expand our old ones. And they're putting 685 million into that project, but they cut 550 million from basic education in Pennsylvania. So, you know, we just we point out these things to young people so they can know what's going on and what the govern the government priorities are. Um, but yeah, back to me, like, so yeah, so after the 18 months I did, you know, I got out, started working with this organization, the Youth Arts and Empowerment Project. And, you know, it really helped me change because the thing is, when I got out, I was in the same community. You know what I mean? It was hard, it's still hard, because one, you know, my dad, he got killed when I was eight. And then my mom, she uh, was on drugs, and I actually don't even really see her that much to this day, but, you know, I do sometimes. And it's like, so me getting out of, Prison, I was alone, and that's what a lot of young people go through. You know, that that's the reason why a lot of young people get involved in the crime in the first place. You know, they don't have the proper guidance, they don't have, and they can't, they don't, can't, and they're supposed to receive those things in school, but they go to school and they have 34, 35 students in one classroom. The teacher can't teach everybody. It's not the teacher's fault, really. It's actually the way that they have it set up. A teacher can't teach 30 something students in 45 minutes. If all 30 students need help, she can't help everybody, and that's just common sense. And I mean, you know, so I was growing up in that type of environment where I couldn't get help from school and then at home, my mom had her problem, my dad was gone, and then it's like when I go to the street, that's the only thing that, that's the only place that I can get help. You know, people say, yeah, you can be with us, you can sell drugs, you can be my friend. They befriend me in the streets, so I went to the streets and that's where I received my help at. And you know, I was poor, I didn't have anything, so you know, in the streets, I sold drugs. That's what I needed, I needed that to survive. Before, but it's crazy because before, you know, I knew my dad, he sold drugs and he got killed or whatever, and I didn't want to do that. It's crazy because I'm not going to do that, you know what I mean? And I really vowed to myself, like, I wouldn't do that, I would sell drugs. I know my dad, he got involved in that, and that's the reason why. That was the reason for his demise. But it's, it's crazy, like, when, when you don't have anything, and it's like, you're poor and you, you're there to fend for yourself. I mean, it's like, I basically, I basically didn't have a choice. And then, you know, I didn't really think, I didn't know about the system. You know what I mean? I didn't know how, you know, it was a big system that was designed for me to basically sell drugs, basically to not receive education. You know, but once I learned that, that's what really actually helped me change. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if it wasn't for that, I probably would have been still doing it. Mm. But I learned, I, I got educated. And when I got educated, it helped me, it helped me step back and think like, hold on, this whole system is designed for me for this to happen. And, you know, and now I look at my other friends and my other brothers and they don't even know that. They don't even see it. You know, so that made me say, you know what, I got to help people understand this. And I mean, some people, they'll understand it. They'll still do wrong. They'll still do sell drugs, but at least they know. And then when they know, it can help them make a better decision. And one day they might just say, you know, I'm giving this up. You know, so that's what really helped me change. You know, I, I seen there was a bigger system and I see, I seen, I seen that I needed, to I needed to change. Cause you know, I was tired of going to jail and I, I, I went to jail for 18 months and it was just like, I was nothing like everybody else. <laughs> Cause a lot of young people there and they're running wild and they're talking about crime and all this stuff. I actually was reading and, 
And I was just, I was just thinking, how did I get here? What's going on? I don't understand this. How did I end up in here? And then I thought about my friends. And you know, when I went in there, I didn't have friends anymore. I didn't. They didn't call. They didn't come see me. And they didn't. They didn't answer the phone as much. They didn't send me money. You know, because when you're in there, you need money. You need people to support you in those places. Because like, if you don't have money, you'll be hungry. The last meal was around like three o'clock, three p.m. And they give you three square meals. And it's like at, after three. three yeah, uh, yeah, basically two. And then like, but no, you gotta think about this. That's, they give you three meals and you're young. So you know you're hungry. <laughs> you're a young kid, you, you need to eat. And it's like 3 p.m., 3, 3.30 is like the last meal you'll get. And you know by 11 you'll be hungry. And you're gonna need somebody to see some money. And you know, my friends wasn't there for me like I would've been there for them. So, you know, that actually helped me too. That actually helped me not hang around me. You know what I mean? Because I understood. And honestly, the reason why I was locked up was because of them. Because of, you know, this conspiracy thing. Yeah. Like conspiracy, that's the real reason I got locked up for the aggravated assault. It's like, so so you're the reason I'm locked up, but you don't support me when I'm locked up. So now I'm like, okay, well now I'm not messing around with them anymore. And that helped me too. But like just learning knowledge about the system and you know how it impacts our communities and how it's set up for certain people to be in it. It make me change. It helped me change. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right. All right.